Yeah, I really like the way you framed in Purgatory Ridge with um, the um, Native American who begins it, and he's on the lake, and you know the terrible tragedy occurs, and the boat breaks up, and his brother is drowned, and whatever. And you have to wonder all the way through the book, you know, are we coming back to that? Are we coming back right. to that? And you know, at various stages, he appears, and things happen, and whatever it is, and then you know, at the end, you bookend it all back together again in ways. Alas, we can't discuss without <laughs> spoiling it. Uh, I thought that you know that takes that takes a lot of control as well as a lot of imagination to you know to to bookend or encircle a story and let it grow within that, but not lose you know not blow away your your ends. One of the uh, the things that made the writing of this book easy was um, I knew fairly early on what the heart of the book was all about. When I um, it was about three quarters of the way through the writing of Boundary Waters and knew then that I was going to need the third book to bring everybody around to where I wanted them to be. But I really wasn't quite sure what the book was going to be about, you know. I thought, well, maybe this will happen and maybe that will happen. Ah. But I didn't know really what the heart of the book was all about. And then I had a woman that I worked with at that point in time come in and, and plop herself down at my desk and she told me the story of the death of her father, who was one of the deckhands on uh, uh, an ore carrier one of those huge ore carriers that plied the Great Lakes. It was called the Daniel J. Morell, uh, and in 1966 it encountered one of those horrific gales that sweep across the Great Lakes at that point in uh, that time of the year. And it broke in half and sank. All of the hands were lost except one man, a guy named Dennis Hale, who survived for three days uh, on an open pontoon raft, dressed only in a peacoat and skivvies, in uh, air temperatures that hovered around freezing, the water temperature was 40 degrees, the winds were 60 miles an hour, and the waves were 30 feet high. This guy should have died, but he didn't. And while he was on that raft, he had just some amazing experiences. When she told me that story, and, and then I read his story, he wrote a great book called uh, Soul Survivor. I read his story, talked to the guy. I knew what I wanted at the heart of my book. You know, in terms of plot, it's about a man who undergoes that kind of tragedy and comes back many years later seeking revenge against the people he believes are responsible for the tragedy. But really, the heart of the book, for me, was the question of how as people do we deal with the hurts that we've encountered in life, those wounds that we've taken, how do we heal those and move on? And when I knew that, I knew that that was going to be resonant in Joe and Cork's relationship and that whole family relationship and not just in, uh, in the John LaPera, the, the Native American who, who survives that tragedy, his life. It, it, was, it resonated through the whole book, and then I knew what the heart was. The book was a fairly easy thing for me to put together at that point, to know where I wanted to begin with that incredible tragedy and see, I, I knew where everything then, that, and that ending we're not going to talk about. Right. I saw that, and it was a very easy thing for me to write to that. Oh, I can see that, and you had the one family mirror the other, and you know there was there was not mirror the other, but there were Certain, elements that, exactly, that mirrored the other. Exactly. But you know, interestingly enough, what really is the main character in that book is the lake. Yeah. And those of us, especially those of us in the Southwest who've not spent time with the Great Lakes, I grew up on the edge of Lake Michigan, so so I'm much more familiar with it. Don't realize Lake Superior's power. Don't realize how terrible it is. It's an enormous presence. And, uh, and for those, and I'm one of them actually, for those people who aren't familiar with the lake, it's a very frightening presence because it is. It's a lake that's always so cold. If you spend any time in it at all, you're dead. You freeze to death. And it's so deep. It's so deep. Um, it's, uh, it contains 10% of the fresh water in the entire world. It's, it contains so much water that were you to cover North America and South America, with the water from that lake, it would cover both continents a foot deep. That's how much water is in that lake. Um, and something so vast, and so, when you think of the storms that sweep across it out of nowhere, so threatening, um, the idea of using it as a character in the book was just a, a great idea. Um, and the other thing, one of the things that I've tried to do in my books is to give each book a presence that, that has a very spiritual spiritual basis to it. Iron Lake, we talk about the, the myth of the Wendigo. That runs through that one. Boundary Waters, it's the wolf who continues to appear throughout the book. Um, and in, uh, in Purgatory Ridge, it's the presence of that lake, which um, is very, um, 
in terms of the Indians, a very sacred body of water. Well, it's truly an awesome body of water, and in two ways. One of which is on it, it's difficult to sail, dangerous, terrible things happen. And the other, which you explore in your book, and which Nevada Barr did in her fav my Superior favorite death. of all her books, is when she wrote about Isle Royal yeah. uh, in A Superior Death. Both of you dive the lake. Mm -hmm. You know, you have your characters going into it. And for a diver, it's an unbelievably awful place to go. It's dark, you know, the, the pressure is tremendous because of the depth. Um, it's freezing. It's, there's nothing friendly That's about right. Lake Superior. So to go under it is even more <laughs> ghastly, really, than to go across it, you know, to go on it. And yet both of you have, have you know, diving as, as part. I don't know how aware people are that ships that wreck in Lake Superior are really gone. You know, they, it's, it's almost impossible to recover a ship that goes down in the Superior. They're so deep. Exactly. Um, so that you can't dive it in a normal way. Um, and often, I think they've, they've located the wrecks now, but the Edmund Fitzgerald for a long time went unlocated. The Daniel J. Morrell, for years and years and years, nobody knew where the second half of the ship, when it broke up, half of it went down, but this, uh, the, the stern, the aft part of it, because the propeller was still turning, carried it off what amounted to an enormous distance before it finally sank. For years, they had no idea where it was. So they are lost. You know, the other interesting thing, though, is, and I think Nevada Bar did this, pointed this out in, uh, in a superior death. People who go down with the ships don't decompose. No, they're frozen. They're frozen. Yeah. So it's like this huge meat locker. Right. So that, uh, so that one of the things that you uh, run the risk of encountering when you dive one of those wrecks is finding somebody who's still there. You bet. Well, it's not just the people um, in Nevada, it's the cargo That's is right. the critical point. That's right. uh, and it had to go deep enough not to break the cargo, but also deep enough to, to preserve it. And that that is a fascinating feature, I think. There are fewer wrecks other places that, that are so well preserved in terms of crew mm -hmm. and content um, yeah. as superior. I'm sure as technology goes on, because there's so much money involved in the cargo, that some of those ships may be raised, in fact, you know, to recover. Uh, what, what was lost. Do you know that what the, this is way off track, but it's an interesting note, one of the things that they're beginning to do as a result of, of the fa that aspect of Lake Superior is to haul up logs that, uh, that sank a long time ago mm. and that have not decomposed because of the nature of the lake and that now are unique because they've, they've logged off all of this kind of timber right. But they can bring up these old logs, and, and it sells for an enormous amount. <laughs> this wood sells for an enormous amount of money. That is fascinating. That's still a version for us. Do you know when I was in England some years ago, they had raised the Mary Rose. I think it's the Mary Rose, and not the Mary Celeste. I hope I'm right. I think it's the Mary Rose, which was one of Henry VIII's um, warships, which was built out of stout English oak, you uh -huh. know, the thing that actually deforested England in the same sense that Minnesota was later deforested. And anyway, they brought it up, and it is still, or at least it was when I was last there, which was not that long ago, um, in, a, in a constant bath, you know, because bringing it up without keeping the, the wood oh, wet yeah. and so forth was to invite disaster. So you've got this sort of giant skeletal, I mean, it's not a complete ship, but anyway, you've got the, the skeleton certainly made it, and a lot of the, um, the, the planking and the whole nine yards, and it's set up in this giant shed, if I recall right, where it's constantly being bathed in water and whatever. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting aspect of marine archaeology. I think there's an even older, like a longboat, maybe it was a Viking ship that was discovered in England somewhere. And it was in a bog, I think, rather than in water. But there again, they've had to deal with, you know, ways to sure, preserve. You, you can't just dry it out. It corrupts very quickly. As opposed to a metal ship, for example, the German U-boat at the Field Museum in Chicago has kept, you know, the, the German sub that was brought up from Lake Michigan, I think, or whatever, whichever great lake it was, and towed into Chicago and mounted there. But that's a metal ship, so, you know, they didn't have to go through all those considerations. <laughs> it's, but it's interesting because I don't think that the ordinary reader would expect to pick up a book about America's heartland, you know, Minnesota, the Midwest, and be reading a sea story.